All right there, superstars. It is time for the special interview of the event. This whole event uh, is built around this one specialist that we have here today. And I want to give you kind of some insights into who this guy is uh, before we bring him in. If you don't know, because I reached out to a lot of you and asked you, hey, do you guys know of Operation Underground Railroad? Have you heard of them? Uh, do you know who Tim Ballard is? Uh, we recently got wind of his documentary on Amazon, Operation Toussaint. And after watching that video and watching that interview is when I got a, just fell into my lap, an opportunity to bring him in to our event. A good friend of one of our members actually reached out to me and said, hey, do you know Tim Ballard? I'm like, Operation Underground Railroad. Yes, yes, I know of them. And he said, well, we should have him at your event. And I was like, yes, let's do that. Now, if you guys are just tuning in, I had shared this earlier. 60% of the sex trafficking victims in the U.S. are coming from foster care. And being that, that my mission is to fix the problems and injustices that are coming from the foster care system, this fits right in line with our message. Now, in 2013, Operation Underground Railroad was started. Uh, the founder and CEO, Tim Ballard, who's, you know, former CIA, Department of Homeland Security, he's been in the thick of this for quite some time, and he wanted to find a way to help more. There's a limit and jurisdiction on a lot of things that they can do, but as a private organization, he can actually work with these governments to get these people saved. I mean, Slavery and sex trafficking is the one of the biggest things out there that is plaguing our world today. And this man is on the front lines of this injustice. So let's bring him to the stage. Let me get a warm welcome to Tim Ballard of Operation Underground Railroad. Let's bring him on in. So it's gonna take a couple seconds here. So give me a second, my friend, there we go. And boom, all right. So he should be joining us any second now uh, as we, oh, there he goes, already popping in. Tim Ballard, welcome to the party, my friend. Thank you, Manny, great great being here. Thanks for having me on. Oh man, this is, this is such an exciting interview. I'm so honored to have you here. I mean, you are on the front lines of one of the biggest challenges that are facing our world today in sex trafficking and, you know, the big thing that you're doing out there is to not just save the victims, but get these people who are perpetrating these these injustices, get them behind bars. You guys just passed the 2000th sex trafficker arrested. Now, huge congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, our, our team is just amazing. The, the faceless men and women who are working in 26 countries, um, anonymous, no one knows who they are. They risk their lives daily to, to get these kids out and work with governments. And it's, it's, it's inspiring to be part of that. This is amazing, man. Now, if you guys that are watching live right now, right, we have a, a very small selected group of people that we invited live for this broadcast before we get it out to the Manifestation School of Business. If you guys have any questions over this interview, we're gonna be answering those questions. So put them in that little Q and A tab and we'll get to them. Now, one of the main reasons I do this event is to bring education and resources to from orphan to CEO. And you're going to be a great addition in there because it's really just tying into learning from people who are active on the front lines of this. Now, just as I shared, 60 percent of foster care um, or sex trafficking victims in the U.S. come from foster care. You're on the front lines of this. What are you seeing on what's happening in this? I mean, how are these kids getting into the hands of these sex traffickers? You know, it's it's a scary thing when you consider how many children are so vulnerable, um, particularly the, 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 the children who are um, in orphanages or in foster care, where oftentimes, especially in developing countries, uh, the, the, the the ability or the will to, to really take care of those kids and watch over them is is, is not where it needs to be. Um, this is why in places where we operate in, you know, a lot of developing countries like Haiti, for example, um, the, the, the children who, 
who uh, get hurt are, are oftentimes in that in the, the orphanage or foster system. And we're working to fix that. We adopted two, two children out of Haiti uh, who we were actually rescued back in 2014. And um, more needs to be done. It just breaks my heart, Manny, every time I go to these countries and I see all these kids uh, who, you know, who have been rescued or are just vulnerable because of the situation they're in. And then I come back to, 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 to this nation. I see so many families who have so much love and so much to give. And I'm just like, come on, we've got to bridge this. We've got to bridge the economy uh, of, of, of love and, and taking care of, of, of these kids. Um, and so we, we actually just started last year a new project at OUR called Children Need Families, where we are facilitating um, uh, what I call Uber after, which is actually adopting children into families. And, and so, um, and also working to change orphanage systems in, in some of these developing countries into foster systems, which is way, way better uh, than orphanage systems. Uh, so we do a lot of work in, in, in this field and, and, and so much more needs to be done in, in terms of the preventative side uh, to make sure kids are being looked after because they're just, they're just not, you know, the vast majority of kids we rescue, I mean, they were taken in the first place. They were trafficked in the first place because there was no family unit. There was no um, guardian even. Uh, and, and that's how the kids, you know, the traffickers look for the vulnerable children and, and they're, they're the ones that get targeted first. So much more needs to be done in this area to, to help protect. So what do you think is one way that we can have a stronger, more family unit? Because I think that is one of the big differences and why we're seeing a lot of this is that we're breaking the family unit versus bringing it together. Now you're faith-based and that's a, a big focus of us. Our three pillars are mentorship, entrepreneurship and faith. How much do you think faith comes into keeping that family unit or does that even play a factor at all? Oh, I mean, the family unit is the key to everything. You know, I, I, we, we study a lot of how to, how to rehabilitate these kids um, because that's just the, the, the extraction, just the very beginning part. We stay with these kids forever. We become their family. And what we've discovered, it's crazy. You know, when, when a child is hurt and, and physically or, or, or sexually abused, there's a physiological response in the brain. The, the brain of a child who's been repeatedly raped and the brain of a child who had trauma like in a car accident where there's a physiological change, sometimes you can't even tell the difference in, in a scan. Um, so how do you heal that then? Well, what, we, what the studies have shown is that if a child is healing in a family unit uh, that, that, uh, in, in a, that's built on, on a foundation of faith, the, the, and doctors can't even explain it fully, but those kids are heal about three times faster being in that wow. unit. So there's, there's power in family and faith for sure. And, and so we try our hardest with our aftercare partners all around the world. We try so hard to make sure that they are trying to be, create a family environment. Um, even if we don't have, you know, a mom and, and, and a dad or a parent, we, we have um, you know, a family um, unit in some other way, the best we can do because the kids, kids need that. I mean, yeah. they need that to heal. They need that to survive. And, and then on the faith question, I mean, I couldn't do anything without faith because, you know, I, I, um, I wouldn't, if I didn't believe in the healing power of that, of faith and of grace, I think I would, I think I would have shriveled up and died by now, uh, having seen the things I've seen, but to know that there is, you know, a way back and that there is full, you know, redemption and grace and healing through faith. I mean, it's what keeps me sane. It's, it's, you know, I, I, I actually feel God's love for those children. You know, it's, it's a tough question, right? People say, how could God let this happen? If there's a God, why would he let this happen? And, and I've had colleagues leave, leave the cause or leave, lose their faith over this. And I have a different perspective where I say, well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, don't, I guess I'm not supposed to know right now. But I do know this, that the closer I get to those kids, as, even on a rescue operation, the lighter I feel, the more... Um, the more uh, spiritual, even faith-filled, I feel. Um, be, why? Because because I feel God's presence around those children, and so mm -hmm. to me, my my faith increases, not decreases, because I feel God's love for those children, and so um, my faith has actually increased quite a bit working this, as opposed to mm -hmm. you know losing my faith. Interesting. And I think that's that's a really strong testament to, you know, how you react to what you go through, because a lot of these people are seeing the same things you're seeing, but they're reacting differently. You know, they're seeing it as 
oh, this is why it's not working. This is why this is doesn't this is not going to be it. But versus the way you've seen it is how it's strengthening that side of things. Now, for these kids that feel lost, I mean, this is I, I see this time and time again because I'm bringing in kids through my foster care program, Manifestation School of Business. We just teach them for free. There's nothing for them to pay for. They just come in and bring all kinds of resources. And a lot of them, they just don't have the motivation. They don't feel like it's possible for them. They've been surrounded by everyone that just told them no, have treated them less than human. I mean, before I was even four years old, I had already suffered malnutrition, abuse, neglect, and even torture. I mean, these kids are not seeing that the world is working for them. What do you tell them? You know, the, the truth is it's hard, it's hard to even tell them anything, especially in the beginning, because nothing, nothing you can really say in terms of trying to explain this to them, or, or they're not going to trust anything you say, first of all. Yeah. Uh, because like you said, they've, they've been told lies their whole lives. It's just about just pouring love into them. Really, the key is serving them. Action. It's action. You serve them. Because when you do that, that does the spirit of service, which I think is the spirit of God, doesn't lie. And, and a child might not be able to identify exactly or articulate what it is they're feeling or what it is they're, um, but it's the strongest message. You, you know, words, words, where words fail, service doesn't. Um, something happens when you serve. It's magical, really. Um, even the person who serves. I feel like God put something in our brains, the science behind service. When you serve people, um, your, your, your brain actually releases a chemical compound a cocktail of dope of a dopamine and serotonin and, and oxytocin and all these beautiful things that happen that then give you courage and happiness and, and optimism and light. We all feel anyone who helps someone else immediately feels that we don't realize there's actually a physiological response happening. Well, to me that that's God putting that in there saying, encouraging us, do it, do this, do this. And and I think that actually opens up the heavens when, when that chemical reaction happens, it's, it's God's way of preparing our bodies to receive more from, from, from above. Um, and so there's a power in serving. It doesn't matter what cause it is, but a child recognizes that. And they, and they, and they're, and they're not, they know it's not deception. When you are pouring yeah. love into them and you are showing love by, by, by your actions, by, by, by what you're doing to better their situation. Um, that's, that's the key. Yeah. I love this. And you know, what you share is, is a lot of, of what, People just need to know that they don't know. They don't understand because they just keep getting brainwashed by everything else they're consuming that doesn't want them to succeed, doesn't want them to have joy. They want them to live in fear, live in anxiety. Now, you started this idea of Operation Underground Railroad back in 2012. You're in Haiti and you found out there was this three-year-old boy that had been kidnapped. Tell us a story behind how this all began. So I learned about this little boy. He was born in the United States, and uh, he was living. He was of Haitian descent. He was living with his family in in, in Port-au-Prince, and he was kidnapped um, from the church where his father was the pastor. Believe it or not, actually from the parking lot, uh, taken, trafficked. Now, this is not an uncommon occurrence in in Haiti. Haiti's number three per capita in the world for trafficking. And I learned about the case, and I thought because he was a U.S. citizen, I could I could make it. A U.S. case, but I found out quickly that I couldn't, and so I had to make a decision. Either you know, I, I kind of got up to my eyeballs already in the investigation. I'd made promises to the family: we're never going to stop till we find your son. And um, and it got to the point where there was two cases at the same time. I, I did it twice. I, I went down to Colombia to do a training and got myself um, deeper than I was allowed to get myself going undercover. Um, and so, in these two situations, Colombia, Haiti. This is both in 2012. Um, I went way beyond the jurisdiction that was that I had as a U.S. agent, so I had to make a decision: either I, either I walk away from these cases and and they die, or I quit. <laughs> um, and so we, we, that's when we made the decision to to quit. And it was a very difficult thing we did personally for me. I, it was a scary, scary thing um, to walk away from. You know, I have six kids at the time, and and uh, to walk away from the most secure job, which is being a federal agent. <laughs> federal employee and going, going into maybe the most insecure job I could think of. And that's starting a nonprofit that statistically is probably going to fail. So it was very scary for me. And it, my wife sustained me with her faith because I, I was losing 
that battle um, in December of 2013. But off we went and, and we went to Haiti and and we uh, worked with the police. And I, I got together a group of people, former law enforcement who had skills, and, and we found the captors, locked them up and rescued um, um, about 25 children uh, who were with the same captors that had, had kidnapped this little boy. Unfortunately, the little boy had already been sold um, and uh, and we we we've yet to find him. We're 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 closer than ever, and we believe we'll find him. But the miracle that has happened, looking for him, we've rescued about a hundred kids on that island, in, including two that, you know, I adopted two children from the very that initial group that we rescued, who who knew the little boy. His name's Gardy. Um, they were with him, but my my two kids weren't sold. Um, we were the first to actually rescue them before they were sold, and so. They're now my children. So my whole life changed in this in this case. They're home. They've been home for for two years, two and a half years now, um, and uh, and it's just um, you know the, the, I think the poignant part of the story though is the father, the, the, the he's this, the pastor, the, the the you know that lost his son, and and I remember going back to him after we did this raid, and I said, I'm so sorry, your son wasn't there. We rescued 28 kids, but your son wasn't there, and I was I mean I couldn't get the words out. I was choking up, and and um, he he started to cry right away. Cause we all believed, you know, his son was going to be there. What it was, was a, it was a front orphanage. It was a false orphanage where they were kidnapping kids. That's what they, these traffickers do like in a, in a, in a disaster, like a hurricane or, or whatever earthquake. Um, and, and people are just dead in the streets and children are walking abandoned. That's when the traffickers come. It's harvest time for the traffickers. They show up, throw signs up over their walls, orphanage here. And the kids are just brought to them. So that's, that's what these people were doing. Um, that's that was the, my children's story. Their parents were killed in in the earthquake in 2010, and they ended up with these traffickers. So, um, so I'm thinking we're going to find them. You know, we went undercover this whole sting operation in this orf in this front orphanage, false orphanage. So here I am with this man, and I'm just saying, your son wasn't there, you know. And and it was the most impactful conversation I've ever had in my life. It was the maybe the most important one. Um, he starts to cry, and then he stops crying. And says, but we rescued 28 kids. And I said, yes, but I'm worried about the one we, we, we didn't get. And he says, no, you're missing the point. He said, if Gardy, my son, hadn't been kidnapped, none of this would have happened. Nobody would have come here. Nobody would have busted up this trafficking ring. Those, 28, those 25 children wouldn't be rescued today. And then he said, maybe the most profound thing I've ever heard anyone say to me, he said, if I have to give up my son, so that these 25 children can be rescued, that is a burden I'm willing to bear. Mm. And changed my life after that. And, and instantly he became my hero. He became the godfather of the whole organization um, and the inspiration in many ways. Uh, wow. and, and so, um, and he actually took eight of those kids into his home. We couldn't find parents for eight of the 28, 25 children. And he he took them in because these were children that, that were rescued in the name of his son. So, wow. you know, you, you meet people like that and it, and it just gives you that, that perspective and, and that drive. That's an amazing story. And, you know, you can see the visual breakdown of that in that um, documentary on Amazon, Operation Toussaint. You guys have another movie coming out based on your life. Uh, and we're going to get to a couple of the questions coming in, but want to ask you, what is the story behind this movie coming out in July? I mean, what's the premise behind it? Is it similar to the documentary? What's going to be the difference? So the, the movie is called The Sound of Freedom. It stars, stars Jim Caviezel, uh, who plays me. I, I actually asked. He was my first choice um, because he plays in my favorite movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, oh, I love that. Yeah, so that's why I chose him. They said, he looks nothing like you. But they, I said, I don't care. But they made him look you know, you'll see. They, they dyed his hair and things. He, he did a great job. Um, so like I said, in the beginning, um, OUR was founded basically on two different operations, or first two operations. The, the reasons we left the government was one, the Haiti operation, and two, this one in Colombia. So Sound of Freedom actually um, tells that story. It, it's the, the film is done. It's locked. It's, it's done. The, the release date may not be July anymore because the, the COVID's thrown everything off. So yeah. it'll be this year at some point. But it tells the story in Colombia, what, what happened mm -hmm. there, and basically um, what, what, what led us to Colombia, 
um, how I went, how I got got myself too far into the <laughs> trafficking ring, I went undercover, and then when my jurisdiction ran out, it was, hey, you got to come home. You can't, you can't be down there. And that was part of the decision. Well, I guess I quit. To, I'll stay here. It ended, it ended up being a massive rescue operation. <clears throat> we rescued about a, over 120 children and other victims wow. of trafficking. 15 traffickers arrested. And it was this mass operation. So that's the basis of the movie is what happened? Who were these? Who was this group? Um, and uh, of, of bad guys and how, how do they operate? And so it kind of gives the, the, that, that, first, that first story and, and explains who we are, what we do. And, and um, we hope it will ignite a movement, you know, that, that more people will recognize that the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world is the selling of human beings. That's a surprising fact to most people. It should be on the headlines every day. Um, Should, but, right? but it's but it's not and and we that needs to change and so that we hope the film will do that i'm excited i'm excited to see it um now kelly duroy she has a question about the aftercare of these victims what types of programs do you put these victim victims in once they are rescued and how can we help yeah it's the most important part of what we do there is no rescue without the healing so what we do is we we don't try to reinvent the wheel and so we, we, we're in 26 countries, but before we'll even lift a finger to work with the police, the first question we ask our, our government partners is, what will you do when we rescue the children? And usually their answer is not sufficient. It's a, some state-run program, and we know how that goes. And so we said, look, we will happily help you, but we have selected these three partners. They're generally uh, nonprofit organizations that, have, that meet our standard Going back to the, the point I made earlier about, uh, will they be a family to these children? We have to expect that many of these kids won't have a, a home to go home to. And so wherever these children are placed has to be their family. So we, we interview that group and we see if, if they're close, but not quite where they, we need them, we'll send resources to them until they get to that place where they have everything a child would need. Not just the basic care, but you know the the whatever therapies might be required. Um, and, you know, what, what trainings might be required. We get very nervous about these children when they age out. Um, just like you age out of an orphanage. Well, what opportunities are, are there for you? It, that's the scariest time right there. So we make sure that they're trained in, in vocational skills. Uh, and so once we have our partners in place, only then will we begin to plan rescue operations. And then once the children are placed in these, um, in these homes, we uh, follow up with them. So we've rescued um, over 4,000 victims, wow. um, but we take care of probably double that number. Because if, if we rescue 10 kids in Thailand and take them to our aftercare center where there's already 30 kids, well, we take on all the all 50 now. They, they become wow. ours forever. And so we, we now start planning to take care of everybody. So we actually put a lot, you know, every year our budget towards aftercare is higher and higher and higher, uh, getting higher than even the rescue side. Um, because okay. again, it's, it's a pointless endeavor to rescue if you don't have a plan in place to bring them to, to bring them back to, to to healing and to reintegrate them into back into society. I love it. So there's definitely a lot of work that has to be done after the fact. It's not just going in there, getting them busted and say, oh, you're all saved. I mean, some of these kids have no place to go. Like in the documentary, you're just talking about this many times. These kids get in, they get rescued, but there's no family. There's no friends. There's nobody that we can take them to. It says, hey, we'll help them, right? And so there's definitely a lot that goes beyond that. So kudos to that as well, because you guys are putting in the work on the front lines and the back end of it as well. Uh, Aaron Feng, uh, now this may come with some definition on some side. I don't know what an SROI report is, but maybe you can highlight that. She says, having conducted an SROI report on sex trafficking prevention, the costs of this crime are overwhelming. What are some of the ways that we can promote sex trafficking awareness and prevention among youth? Great, great question. The awareness piece is so, so important. Um, uh, not just, you know, not just to educate kids. Like, it's so sad. I mean, if you see how, how these um, children are taken and the movie Sound of Freedom gets into it, there's a real case about, uh, it's, it's Miss Cartagena is, is, the, is one of the main villains in the movie. She's a real person. Um, Kathy, Kathy Juarez is her name. She's a Colombian beauty queen. I mean, she was, she was using her fame and beauty and 
credentials in that way to recruit children to her modeling school. She actually won. She actually won um, Miss Cartagena on the platform that she would help impoverished children in in that region in Colombia. And and by all appearances, that's what she was doing because she was giving scholarship to impoverished children to her modeling school. But her modeling school turns out to be a sex trafficking front. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's, she, she's taking these kids and saying, well, part of the job is to watch these videos and she shows them porn and, and, she, and then says that you're going to go do that act with this man. I mean, horrifying. Right. And, and so it's, it, the awareness is to teach people, especially in vulnerable places, don't fall for this. It's the lure, you know, people often ask me about the movie taken, you know, and how real is that? Well, they, they generally uh, very real, except they don't generally hard kidnap someone. They don't rip them out of their homes or a hotel because you, you kick up a lot of dust and you get a response similar, maybe not, not quite similar, you know, but, but like the response and taken, right. You get, you get chased after. Why do that? These, these traffickers are businessmen. They're, 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 they're horrific subhuman monsters, but they're business people, right? So if they can get the lure, that's what they're going to do. They go up into a, a poor village and say, Hey, we want to hire you to be our nanny. You, here's a cell phone. You can call your mom every day. And, and see them on the weekends. No, and then they take them and ship them off to another country. So that awareness piece is so important to get the word out. And we have programs where we do that is teach the youth everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Be careful. Don't fall for this. In the United States, we're, we have a huge problem here. We have a huge problem. We're the number one consumers of child rape videos in the world. And so all of our pedophiles are online right now, just in the last... I'm, I'm working on an op-ed right now because just in the last two months, um, because of our response to COVID, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure that generally keeps children safe, schools, aftercare programs, people don't realize we were warning, the FBI warned, but you got, you got kids shoved computers in their faces and said, you're going to stay here and be on this computer. Mom and dad are in survival mode, right? Trying to save their jobs or save their businesses or or scavenge for food and supplies. So the kids are, 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 are mostly left alone and the pedophiles are home. The, the, the American pedophiles, they're also home and they also have their computers. We, we have labs throughout the country in the world that we monitor the dark net. And these pedophiles are saying harvest time, harvest time, pandemic time is harvest time. And the, the reports get this in, in, in March of, of, of this year, there was 2 million additional more, 2 million more than last April, 2019, reports of child abuse in March and 4 million times last year's number in March, 4 million more. So millions of kids have been sexually assaulted the last two months because of the fact that they don't have the infrastructure that's supposed to keep them safe. Um, and and the education piece didn't come with with the lockdown orders, right? And, and that's this is, this is the prevention. This is the awareness piece. Do your kids know that when they're playing Call of Duty and they think they're playing with, with some other 13-year-old kid? No, it's it's a 60-year-old guy in, in New York City who's scheming to grab them eventually, right? There was just in Salt Lake. Um, I'm, I'm here at our office in Salt Lake. Just two weeks ago, this guy, Danny Hardman, 43 years old, was arrested. Uh, he, was ga he was online gaming and via Facebook with two six-year-old girls playing their little six-year-old games, grooming them. And he actually got them to send naked pictures of themselves wow. to him. And, and the parents were like, I just thought my kid was playing some little, you know, butterfly game that was just innocent. And, and yeah, they play with other people. They, you never would dream that it's, it's, it's a 40, 45-year-old pedophile two states away. You know, so this is the prevention piece and the awareness piece that is killing us. Is it's, it doesn't exist like it needs to exist. Um, and then, you know, the other, the other thing we, we need to talk about that no one wants to talk about is how do these guys get to the point? I'm, look, I've, I've interrogated dozens and dozens and dozens of, of pedophiles who, who we've arrested, right? And they, generally they talk and they tell their story. Well, wh why do you want a 10-year-old girl? Why do you want a 7-year-old girl? What is going on in your mind? I mean, there's, there's yeah. no profile. These guys are professionals. They're, I've, we've arrested law, doctors, lawyers, educators. You know, it's, there's, there's no profile. They look like anybody. What happened to you? And it's, it's one of two things. Either they were abused sexually as a child, and so their brain got messed up and rewired, and that became 
what sex was, adult child, and then when they became an adult, it's a horrific cycle. But the vast majority of the cases isn't that. It's I got addicted to to pornography, and um, and and I've read a lot of science that backs up this. Um, you know, very few people are going to have that level of addiction that that is, that's using porn, but but there's enough that it creates this horrific demand because what happens is the brain releases chemicals. That's the excitement of porn. And like marijuana, um, eventually in, in a lot of cases, the, the chemical reaction, the dopamine hit stops working because your body gets used to it, right? It's, it's like marijuana eventually, hey, I'm not getting the hit I used to get. So you have to elevate to something else. And these guys, it's not even about the naked pictures anymore. It's just how do I get the chemical reaction? I need the dopamine. I need it so bad, I'll do anything for it. And so now they're trying to up, you know, get, get to the most, something more hardcore and they start going to younger ages and they, they go to, you know, just barely legal, then 17, then 15. And then, and then all of a sudden they they need the drugs. So they just try something crazy. Well, what about five-year-olds? Maybe that'll get me going. And all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're caught in an undercover sting operation where they're buying a child. So part of the awareness piece is educating our youth, particularly our, our, our boys, you know, our young, our young boys and say, Hey, be careful with, with, with this stuff. I mean, it, it can really mess you up um, and make you something you don't want to be. Um, so I think that's an important awareness. And even if people don't become, again, it's a small fraction that would become actually pedophiles, um, but that small fraction of a very large populace that's, that's participating in porn is enough to do a lot of damage, right? But um, Time Magazine did a, did a cover piece not long ago, a couple of years ago that I make my teenage boys read. Um, it's these, these strapping athletic guys who were mass addicted to porn through high school and it messed with their brains. And, and all of a sudden they weren't getting the natural use of their frontal lobes, what, what doctors call like the pleasure center. And so they marry these, you know, they marry beautiful women and they can't even have relations with them. They, they, they physically, it's not working because the porn overstimulated, overused the system and the dopamine kind of, you know, it was an overhit, Right. So there's a lot of, of, of there's a lot of reason to, to make sure our, our youth especially understand the dangers here. Um, again, yeah. it's not popular. Uh, media doesn't want to talk about this as, as a solution to anything because there's so much money that, that goes into this. And, but it's, 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 it's just an, an important part of the conversation. You know, addiction is, is, the, is the root of why children get grabbed and get made they get become the subject of child rape videos and so forth it's 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 addiction and and fighting that is important yeah. so very important and i thank you for bringing it up because it's something that you know with this platform we want to share what's really going on what do these kids need to know what is something that they could be looking out for to help them along this journey because you know, a lot of us, we've been down these roads already. We can speak based on experience and not just sugarcoat life for them. Now, you guys watching right now keep getting questions on how can we support that? How can we how can we learn more? How can we get involved? I've set up a text in keyword. If you just text in the word rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, -E, you're going to get connected to uh, OURrescue.org. It's going to get rec directly to their organization so you can see all the stuff that they've got going on. And then we'll send Tim a list of everybody if they've got something else that you want to follow up with them on as well. Uh, but Robert Wall asks, what is the best way we as entrepreneurs can help in this wonderful cause? In addition to raising funds, is there anything we can do physically hands-on? Yeah. So we actually, if you go to our, our website and you become an abolitionist, you can look up how to become, a, you, you become a vetted volunteer basically. And we, we have a test that we, that we give people. It's a curriculum and you actually take a test and become certified. And it teaches you all the, all the signs of trafficking. And that's something that if, you, if you're an entrepreneur and you encourage your, your teams, hey, go do that. Go do this real quick. Um, you know, uh, and just by getting eyes and ears out there. I mean, it's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, right? And the United States has become, in the, we're, the top, we're in the top three for destination countries for trafficking. So there's a lot of it happening all around. Most of it here is online. You know, you go to developing countries, it's, it's on beaches and street corners. Not that it's not that way here, but mostly it's online. But if you just knew the dangers and you could just keep your own kids or nieces or nephews or students or friends who are children safe, um, and, and, and understand what to look for, how to report it. That would be very, very helpful. But also just getting people talking about it. 
you know, when, when we talk about how do we end this, how do we end something where there's 10 million children enslaved? If you include the adults, it's up to 30 million people, more slaves than ever in the history of the world, in the history of the world. That's hard for people to grasp because our history books kind of taught us that we got rid of that. That's a, that's a thing of the past. It's not. Um, but how did they end the legalized form of slavery? There's lots to be learned there. This is different forms. This, the slavery is different in many ways. And so you, I don't want, you know, you got to be careful with comparisons because you don't want to cannibalize the integrity of these stories and history. But yeah. but there's lessons to be learned, you know. Did Abraham Lincoln just finally, after 300 years of, of, of slavery, just raise his hand and say, I decree it's over? That's not what happened. Um, it's a stain on our history and our country that this could even happen for the, the hundreds of years that the transatlantic slave trade existed. So how did it end? How did the legalized form of it end? Well, yeah. The answer to, the, to that question is the same answer we need to employ right now. People got loud. That's it. The government didn't, didn't act until the people got loud. And in the 19th century, a group of abolitionists led by Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, um, Harriet Jacobs, so many others. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe was one. Uh, her her story is interesting because she wasn't a slave. And so most people that we're talking to here weren't slaves. Maybe not everybody. About this one. There you go. Yeah, that's 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 my book. You can learn about there. I just got it in the mail over the weekend. So I hadn't been able to have a chance to read it, but I was like, man, this is going to be great because it just ties into kind of the details of everything that's going on. Right. It, it of shows so, how I used that, those historical heroes to guide me in my mission because we, we, mm -hmm. we discovered, we discovered um, modern day slavery really no one is even talking about it when I started as a government agent in the early 2000s. And so when I was asked to go in there, there was no curriculum for this. And so my curriculum became history. Okay, Harriet wow. Tubman, talk to me. You know, what did you do? How did you do this? I know it's, it's different, but I can learn something. And, you know, like Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the media. And she joined her voices with the other abolitionists. And when Abraham Lincoln met her for the first time in the White House, he said to her, so you're the lady that wrote the book that started this war. And so even he recognized it wasn't him. I mean, he, he did the right thing when he had the chance to do it. But um, it took a mass movement of people to yell so loud that that's what the media is going to start listening to. You know, the media today is a funny thing. I mean, they're, they're businesses. So they're trying to give the people what they want. And it seems to me, this is my opinion, that people want to be outraged. On, on, on every side of everything. They want to be outraged, so the news is giving them outrage. You know, most headlines don't even correspond with the actual story. You're like, wait, this, the headline said this, the story said something different. Um, but it's, it's clickbait for outrage, outrage, outrage. And usually, well, oftentimes, the outrage is based on something false. But it doesn't matter. To the people, the consumer wants to be outraged. And it's good, because you get a dopamine hit. You get some chemical reaction in your body. You, and, and, and the problem is, is, we need to get the people demanding something different. We need to get the people right. demanding um, to know more about slavery, historical, modern day um, slavery and, 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 and injustice. And, and so historically speaking, you know, in the recent history of this, of this nation, at least, I feel like we're not talking about it. How are we not talking about um, children and, other, and, and men and women who are enslaved? Uh, real slavery. I'm talking locked up. You don't control your body. Slavery. Yeah. And so we hope that, that to answer the question, get your people talking about it. Get your people understanding what modern day slavery is. Talk about it. Get loud about it. And, and, and maybe someday a president will come to you and say, so you're the group that, that, that did that post or did that film or got loud. You're the reason that we actually have a war against modern day slavery. Um, we need to learn that lesson. Now, you've been able to take this message all the way to the White House. I mean, you're seated right next to the president sharing these injustices. What do you think is going to happen from that? I mean, is there any action being taken now? Is there something that's going to be done about this injustice? Or are we just still waiting and spinning our thumbs? Yeah, I was called um, really randomly um, last year. Uh, I was in D.C. I did a news piece on trafficking and someone in the White House was watching and said, hey, the president wants to hear more about what you're saying. Um, it was literally that fast. And the next morning I wake up, I'm in the White House briefing the president. And unfortunately, you know, I don't, I'm going to add this. This is not a political issue. I would have run just as quick to any president who called of any party. Um, believe it or not, we lost 
a thousand, um, we lost about a thousand um, recurring donors who knew we were rescuing kids and they believed in us. But because I dared meet with the president that they hated to, t to talk about how kids are being kidnapped and, and enslaved, we, they stopped supporting us. And, you know, we should never, I'm kind of on a tangent, but we should never bring ourselves to a place where we hate any one person more than we love rescuing children from being raped. It's, 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 exactly. it's, it's that, it's that stark and it's that disturbing, but, um, but anyway, so um, that has led to the creation of new legislation for sure. Um, there, I'm part of a council, the, a white house council to end, to, to stop human trafficking. Uh, the president announced a new position that's never been had before. One of my friends actually just got the position. I'm so, super happy for her. Um, that's a white house, basically czar of anti-trafficking. Um, so a lot, a wow. lot is being done right now to address it more than ever before, which we're so grateful for because there's so much more, um, there's so much more that, uh, that can be done and needs to be done for these kids. We just need to put them first. If we can get above the politics of everything else and just, just make it about getting these kids safe. Um, and so there's, there's, there's things happening, but I would say this, that the, the, the white house's response, like any other government response is responding to the people we have, the people have been getting louder 10 years ago. You yeah. could probably Google human trafficking and it might not even come up, you know, for sure. 20 years ago. Uh, so people now know it, they know what it is. Human trafficking is slavery and, um, people, so there are, it's, it's us that are, we, we, but we need to keep it loud. We're not loud enough yet. We are not loud enough. I feel like every day there should be at least one story on how children are being raped by the millions. Uh, that, I mean, that should be the headline at least every day until we solve that problem, as opposed to other things I'm seeing often in the news. I'm just thinking, how is that more important than these kids that we you know? It's it's a it's a frustrating it's a frustrating thing, but we're doing our best to to wake people up. I mean, I mean, I feel the same way in the foster care system. I mean, I'm thinking. With two out of three of these kids that are aging out, ending up dead, homeless, or in jail, why isn't this front page news? I mean, the sex trafficking, the the victimness. I mean, there's just too many things that we could be bringing solutions to. And I think you know, with you on the front lines of this, we're we're seeing this in real time. And being that you're documenting this process, this is going to be the map. This is the roadmap for people on how to do this. I mean, you had that one issue. You're part of an agency where you have jurisdiction and you're like, well, I've got to be able to solve this somehow. You created an organization that does just that, partners with other organizations, and you've arrested thousands of sex traffickers because of this process that you've been able to create. So kudos and thank yous to that for that. Uh, James Allen asks, does Underground Railroad work with Thorne? Yes. Yeah. Thorne is an amazing organization founded by um, Ashton and Kutcher and Demi Moore. Uh, and what they yeah, do is they build tech, they build technology, great, great technology uh, to, to, to help law enforcement identify children online. So um, we, we have, we have worked with them. We support them. Uh, we actually, I actually want to work a lot more with them. We, we have contacts in 26 countries. And so we like to turn people to them. Hey, look, see if you can use some of their tools. They have amazing tools uh, and they're fighting this in a, in a very, very powerful way. For sure, technology is key, especially to to grab our our pedophiles here in this country. They're all they're all beginning online. That's where they find the kids. Because that's where all the kids are at. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing for me when I started doing these from orphan to CEO events. They were live events. I was physically getting people out to an event, getting Chipotle to sponsor it and all that to get them excited. And we get one out of ten to physically be able to get there because they're all online. They're just there all day, yeah. and so that's what they told us. So like you need to put this school online because that's the only way we're going to access it. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. So now this one comes, a few people have been asking this um, and I get asked this a lot. How do you become foster parents or how do you become caretakers of these kids that are being rescued? Is there like a place where they can go to apply to be part of this solution? I mean, where do you go to kind of partake in that side? Of it? So go, if you go to our website, OURrescue.org, we have a way for people to, to we, we literally have 13,000 registered volunteers all with different wow. skill sets. It's the coolest thing. We, have, we actually had to get some software to even organize it um, because that many people sat down, took the time to fill out an application out, take the test. And, and now we, you know, we, we, we have needs for things and they just like, it's amazing. Like we, we need an aftercare home needs something. 
and we just send out who who's, who lives near this place, who can get this, and it happens every time. So the key is getting registered, telling us what your skill set is, and then and then letting us get put you to work. Awesome. Well, there you go. They've got a solution right there. They've automated the process. Yeah. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, Susan Bond asks, "Thank you for being the change we want to see, or you want to see in the world." There's so much social unrest and strife today, and your work is so important. How do you cope with the tragedies you see and keep going? <sighs> well, it's 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 um that's a that's a it's a really good question, and and um it, it definitely takes its toll. You know, I, I, it beats you up um, to to see this stuff and and uh, and not just uh, just want to keel over and, and die. You know. <laughs> um, I, my answer to that, I mean, every person to have to answer that individually who works in this. Um, personally, for me, it's it's my family, it's my wife, it's my faith that that I can go home to, and and have with me when I'm not at home. Uh, that that cleanses me and and, and uh, allows me to purge the the darkness. You know, uh, you, you got to have a way to purge the darkness um, because it's what this is is something so grotesque. The things that I have seen. I couldn't even put it into words. It's that evil. It's that kind of evil that a decent, a, 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 a respectful, decent mind wouldn't even be able to conjure up in their minds what e what what kind of evil we're talking about. The, the the acts that are committed on children, and and the the and how much the quantity of it. Um, it's 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 real evil. It exists in this world, and and I I don't know how to answer that question personally, other than family and faith purges the darkness from me. That's it. <laughs> now, when you say we got to get loud, you know, we're in a time right now where people are definitely getting pretty loud. I would say to the extreme. Now, when you say we got to get loud, what do you really mean by that? What is like the, the process that we need to go to actually affect change? Cause looting, rioting, I don't see that really affecting change. It's just causing more chaos and chaos just breeds chaos. What do you think is the actual solution? I think, I, I again, I go back to the 19th century and how they did it. Um, mm. They used media, every media source they could. Back then it was books. Back then it was speaking. They were kind of limited. Um, today we have documentaries, opportunities, books, online, uh, feature films, um, you know, websites with curriculum and information. Uh, and so what we, you'll find that we have used all of those, but what we need is more people contributing to those, you know, people going to see the documentary, go, uh, if everybody watched Operation Two Saint, which is on Amazon, you mentioned earlier, if everybody watched just that documentary with a question that at the end of this, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to, what I'm going to do, what, what big or even little part I'm going to play to help rescue children, they will have the answer by the end. So that's what I mean by getting loud is 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 getting people engaged uh, it can't just be an emotional response um that because like that won't lead to as you as you mentioned just now an emotional kind of chaotic response isn't going to generally lead to much it's got to be a smart a smart response uh, loud and smart about it you know this is the problem i just learned what it was what can i now do strategically to fight this Maybe get involved in politics. Maybe make sure my representatives, elected officials, know about this problem, and they're making sure the resources are getting to our local law enforcement unit to combat child exploitation. Um, you know, maybe I'm going to go do big events. Maybe I'm going to host screenings of the documentary, or or, or other organizations. There's several organizations that are that do what we do that we support. You know, there's so many. Find one. I don't care what it is, and and find out what you're best at. People ask me all the time, uh, "What can I do? What can I do?" And I say to them, you will know before I know what you can do. I don't know your skill set. I don't know where you're, where, where you're, how much time you have. I don't know what you already know. But, but go watch Operation Two Saint. I tell them, or, 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 or you know, another one of our. We have another documentary um, coming out soon called Triple Take. But, but go watch that, or go online, re watch some of our videos, and then, and then, and then call me and you tell me what you want to do. You know, because you'll know before me. And that's what we need people to do: is ask themselves, what can I do, and then, and then, and then they do it. I love it. This is a, a really good question. I think that um, I, I've always wondered, right, after you rescue them, what percentage of them would you say end up 
I would say, I mean, you can't really gauge too much of what's a normal life, but what would you say the percentage of them have the ability to not just survive, but then go and then thrive from the ones that you rescue? The vast majority of them, you know, every case is, is unique, but when they have the care they need and the aftercare they need, um, they, we, we set them up for, for success. So I'd say the, the vast, I don't have an exact number. It's, it's, it's hard to measure success. Because right, yeah. There's always healing that everybody needs. Right. No, I don't know that everyone's ever like, I'm healed from a world of being a, a, a sex slave victim. Um, I don't know that, you know, it's, it's a constant, but um, the, 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 the numbers are very, very high in terms of those that we feel like we can, we help and they can integrate back, integrate back into society, um, fulfill their dreams. I mean, just getting them to know that they can have a dream. I mean, I've, I've had these, these tearful conversations with survivors. Well, you know, a child, what's your favorite color? And they're like, am I allowed to even think about that question? I mean, you know, can you imagine that? Like a 10 year old think I'm, I'm not supposed to be thinking about a favorite color. I've been told that's none of my business. I mean, that that's literally the, the rewiring that, that these, that these traffickers do to children. And so just getting them thinking about what the dream is and then helping them accomplish that dream and say, okay, what do you want to be? I want to professionally, I like to be this someday. Okay. Let's work towards that. Here's some of the things that you can you, the tools that will get you there. And, and so that's what we try to do is get them thinking that you can do anything you want to be. You can be anything you want to be. And we're going to, we're going to help you until you get that, you know, and some of our kids, we're only six years old. So a lot of the kids that we've rescued are now, you know, turning 17, 18, 19, and we're still there. You know, we're, we're, we get them scholarships to the schools they want to go to or, you know, help them get into a job of their choice. And it's to watch it happen, to watch these kids that were so young when we rescued them and now they're, they're, they're fulfilling their dreams. It is, that's, that's the thing that makes it all worth it. I love it. And part of what manifestation does is take kids that either in similar situations like that, maybe they're day one entrepreneurs. When I first started this idea, it was to take the aged out foster kids and say, let's teach you how to build your own dream. I mapped out a whole process of how I teach other businesses, how I do this. And I said, this is how you do it. I taught them for free. Then I created my own digital ERC 20 token, Manny Bucks, that these kids earn by going to school. And then they can turn around and use those Manny Bucks within our community. So then our experts that they collaborate with can do it without charging them anything. So we don't have to donate to them so they don't show up to it. They get to earn their way to collaborate with these specialists. And I think if we could get these kids more opportunities without the barrier of money, because a lot of these kids, I mean, I've got 68 countries that we have students in in manifestation. I would say 99% of them could never afford any one of my programs. And that's the best part about why we do it is that there is no barrier. If they want to learn and they have access to the internet, bam, they can plug awesome. in. And with what you're doing, I mean, you're plugging in just physically right there, the mentorship, the entrepreneurship, the faith, getting them to see that it's possible because somebody else right there, they only need one person. That's what it took for me. You know, I've, I'm 33 years old. I'm still dealing with a lot of the stuff that I had to go through in those first couple years of life. I am not 100%, right? I mean, I may be what you call thriving or surviving, and I'm on the other side of it, but I still got to go through things that I struggle with. So I would say there's probably never a time where you're fully like, oh, yeah, that doesn't mean nothing. Like, I am too blessed to be stressed, always a smile, but there are times when I struggle with why do I have to keep feeling this way? Why do I have to keep responding this way? And, you know, it's a daily struggle. Um, Betty Norlin asked, she goes, as a teacher, are there things I can bring into the classroom, like for middle school kids, that even if subly, subly can help these kids not get caught up in this sex trafficking world? Absolutely. Uh, we, there's all sorts of curriculum. Um, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is actually a great resource. Um, they have mm -hmm. programs set up for educators to to educate them so they can then pass on valuable life-saving information. So the National Center, and also we have we have curriculum as well. Um, if you go to OURrescue.org. Awesome. So if you guys uh, need the spelling of that, they put it in the chat. You can just text in rescue. It's going to text you right back that exact link so you can get to it. Um, now for what you're focused on right now, where do you see the next 12 months, the next five years? I mean, what do you want to see this industry do? Is there a specific goal you have in mind 
when you really originally started this to find one person, yeah. right? And now you've built it to this whole global phenomenon that is just, is going to change the world and has changed the world for so many already. Is there new goals that you've created? What are you trying to see happen the next couple of years? Well, our, our goal is to empower others, right? Our, our team isn't big enough to rescue millions of kids. So we want to empower law enforcement and aftercare homes. That's what we do is, is, is get them what they need. And so we're in, we're in 26 countries and in, in a decade, I'd like to be in 126 countries and know that all those countries are thriving. The law enforcement agencies and the aftercare agencies and partners have everything they need. Um, and that's, that's our goal. In so many countries, it's still not even, the people haven't been loud enough to affect the change. So we can knock on the door of a certain country and they'll say, not interested. Like, we'll come in and give you free equipment, free training. Yeah, not interested. Uh, the people aren't clamoring yet. And so, and so, you know, what, what OUR wants to do is provide those tools, the training, and let them rescue the millions in their country and let them res rescue the millions in their country. Um, and when we realize that we can't get into some places because the other places will say, yeah, come on in. And then we get around and we're like, hey, you don't have the passion or the laws. And we have to sometimes, rarely, but even we'll be like, we can't, do, we can't help you because you're not, you're not even wanting to help yourselves yet. And so how do we solve that? How do we get those countries to open up and prepare themselves? Well, it's, it goes back to getting loud, getting their people loud. Uh, the movie Sound of Freedom was designed, the filmmakers, you know, we didn't make it. This was independently made um, outside of us. Um, but they're, they are very much cause-based. So they, they have superstars in that film from five different countries. 16 of the scenes are filmed in Spanish, translated back into English. Um, and that's on purpose because we're trying to use that film to, to get their, their populations loud and mad that this is happening. And then we can go knock on the doors. Oh, I guess do you want our help now? Because now, now it looks like you're responding to your own people. So that's kind of our approach on our marketing is, 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 is get people outraged over the fact that children are being hurt this way. I love it. So if you guys want to help in getting this message out there, my suggestion, take some pictures of this, of this interview, take some video clips of what you've been seeing shared and get this out there. Use the hashtag OUR Rescue. Use the hashtag Network of Influence. Get this message out there, guys. Now, I want to be respectful of your time and I want to just leave you this one last question. But before I do, I wanted my wife wanted to say a couple things. Uh, she really just wants to say that she's so proud of everything you guys are doing. She's a huge supporter. She sees you as a huge hero. I mean, a big passion for her is to save as many children as she can. And when she first came across your organization, I mean, I would watch her watch videos and cry and just see the things that she's seeing that's happening. She's like, this is unreal that this is happening in our world. And then she sees how a faith-based organization is out there making a change. And it just shows the power of what God can do when, you know, he gives this world free will. And that's, the, I think, the big answer to why these things keep happening is that there is free will for humans to make the wrong decision and the right decision. And when we have more God in our lives, you see more of that right decision being made. And when we keep taking God out of our lives, well, we're seeing what's happening day in and day out. What is one last thing you want to leave with our audience? You know, I'll thank you. Thank you for showing up. <laughs> um, this is a hard topic. That's why people don't, that's why people run away from it. It's why they ran away from it for 300 years in this country, in, in our country before the abolitionists got loud. They don't want to talk about it. It hurts. It hurts to look at it. It hurts to think of a 10 year old child being hurt that way because you have a 10 year old child or grandchild. I get it. It hurts. It hurts. And so the fact that the people that are even here listening, you're heroes to me that even, because I know how bad it hurts. I, believe me, I've cowered and I've run from this more times than, I'm, than I would like to even admit um, because it hurts. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us. And, um, and, and, and now that you've done this, take the next step and, and go watch Operation Two Saint. That seems to be affecting yes. me. Every, if you haven't seen it, you know, listen, if you can put up a, a link to it or it's just Amazon Prime, um, Operation Two Saint, uh, go watch it and ask yours at the end of it, know that you're going to have something you're going to do, whatever it is. Um, and then 
find three people, send the link to them.